The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. just want to pray that this message could help navigate in your small group circles. It's basically part two or what we're calling how to release the spirit. What are the hindrances of releasing the spirit? Because being saved and having Jesus in is the easy part. It's allowing Jesus to express himself through you that can get difficult. Okay. So I want you to eliminate self-sabotage. We have a series on self-sabotage if you want to expand on this, but I really want to cover this. How many know that sometimes we found the enemy and it's really not the devil, it's been us? Huh? Have you ever shot yourself in the foot, so to speak, and said, I remember when I started, when Jennifer and I got married and we started ministering, Jennifer goes, oh my goodness, I don't even have anybody to blame for this. I did this all by myself. <laughs> we can do a lot of stuff to ourselves, but eliminating this, this is that if you're saved, but self, you know what I mean by self? That's that outer man. That's that, that, that mind, will, and emotions. That's your flesh, and it lusts against the spirit. If it's ruling, it has a tendency, and this, we covered this on Tuesday, so I suggest if you want to go over that, uh, you can. But the mind can be so locked into ideas and opinions that God's revelation, God's will, God's mind can't be revealed because you're too locked in. You don't ever, everybody has opinions, everybody has ideas, but when you hold them loosely under the lordship of Jesus, then creativity can flow to that mind. Revelation can flow to that mind. Vision and dreams can flow to that mind. So you don't want to be so opinionated. And I never forgot that when Bob Jones said that one time. We were in a conference in New England, and he said, he asked the Lord, how come you didn't tell me that and you told other people that same thing? And he said, because you already had an opinion. Isn't that something? You can actually have such a strong opinion about something. What was that, what was that uh, psychological word? Cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance. You know what that means? Is even if you heard the truth, you're so locked into your opinion, it kind of bounces off. Like, like, I love hot dogs. <laughs> Not really. Uh, I, my, mine would be, I love donuts. <laughs> I eat donuts regularly daily. Donuts are not good for you. Cognitive dissonance. Can you deal with that fact? When you love something and you do it regularly and then you hear a thought, that's not good for you. How powerful is that thought? Cognitive dissonance goes, eh, tilt. <laughs> and what we don't want is cognitive dissonance with God. So that mind, our opinions and ideas need to be surrendered to him. So if God is going to release the anointing through any of us, we've got to understand the three battlegrounds of the mind, the will, and the emotions, because all three of those are flesh, and all three of those can resist the Holy Spirit. And what happens is you stay saved, but you live a confined, restricted life to where Jesus never really gets to express himself fully and completely through you because you're hanging on to something. If you're a mind person, it's your ideas and opinions, and you don't budge. If you're a will person, uh, you have to be in control. And control says, nobody's going to tell me what to do. Mm -hmm. And control basically is impulsive, and it's non-yielding. We even said that a real willful person, a real willful person, basically will agree to assistance, but never surrender. If they go for counseling, they'll hear your opinion, but they're not going to do anything about it because it would require surrendering to the Lordship of Jesus, and they don't want to relinquish control. And they also now, in narcissistic attitude, it's getting a little heavy, but in a narcissistic, proudful, prideful attitude, they say, they couldn't help me anyway. I went, but they couldn't do nothing with me. I'm too complicated. 
And then what, what do we usually say when people tell us how intelligent and complicated they are? Roots are simple. Humility is rooted in God. Pride is rooted in Satan. Uh, let's keep it simple. Let's go for root issues. Pride or humility. By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches, honor, and life. Isn't that something? That if you really had a more radical surrender to God, by the fear of the Lord or reverence or respect or an act of humility and submission to the Lord, by humility and the fear of the Lord are riches, honor, and life. Isn't that everything the flesh goes after? Riches, honor, and life. But when you do it by willpower, it doesn't work. And then you get disappointed and can't understand. But I want to cover, uh, and if you're an emotional person, this would be more, this was my weakness as a, as a young believer. Mine was not so much in the mind or the will. Mine was in the emotional area. I allowed my likes and my dislikes, my preferences to rule. And when I surrendered my preferences to God and got neutral, I found out that what God had was so much superior to my likes and dislikes. And I found out that the way he broke it when it came to people was receive everybody. And this was good advice for me when I was a young pastor. Receive everybody that comes in the door as if you were entertaining an angel. Because if you let your likes and your dislikes come in, you may interfere with someone that was meant to be instrumental in your destiny. Destiny includes people. Destiny includes success. You can have success without destiny by using people. But destiny always includes people through divine connections. And if you allow the Holy Spirit to put together who he wants to put together and treat them with dignity and respect... God will use them in furthering his purposes through you. So today I want to eliminate self-sabotage. I want to give some tools on how to eliminate that self. The beginning of the problem is you, you literally become a law unto yourself or self-rule. That's where the problem starts. In other words, I'm looking out for number one. I've raised myself. Nobody ever helped me. I've raised myself by the bootstraps. Therefore, if I don't do it, it doesn't get done. Have you ever said that to yourself? If I don't do it, it doesn't get done. All right. This may be the beginning then of the problem. All right. You become a law, and it's not God himself, but it's, it's really you learn to do this. And our ministry is totally, totally, the purpose for 40 years now has been not to get people saved. That's the work of an evangelist. My job is after they're saved to get a release of the Spirit of God from them, to maximize their potential and to mature them, to get that, that final release. Because there are people who have been born again and move in the gifts of the Spirit uh, for many years, but they're still living a confined, restricted life. They're still pretty much in control. You become the source. And here's how you can tell if you are in control. And this, by the way, will sabotage your Christian walk. You're in control is because you become the source of reward and punishment. Who should be giving us the rewards and or punishment? Should have been our Heavenly Father should have the, the option to discipline, loving discipline. But when your flesh is in there, you are actually, just like uh, God spoke to David Wilkerson one time. He said, David, David was preaching some hard hellfire brimstone message, and God says, David, straight is the gate and narrow is the way, but you're making it straighter and narrower than I ever did. <laughs> now, that's getting pretty religious when you can be tougher than God, all right? But what he was doing was he was realizing that he was becoming the source of reward and punishment judge, jury, and executioner of their own life. You will self-sabotage. You will explode. Your view of justice becomes the standard. Mmm, there's a telltale sign. Get a little red flag. That's not fair. Anybody ever think that even if you don't verbalize it? That's not fair. Guess what? Life's not fair. First thing I had to do was die to the fairness doctrine. Life's not fair. You have a right to try. You have a right to fail. You have a right to try. You have a right to try again. You have a right to succeed. That's just life. 
You need to be delivered from the carrot and the stick and place yourself in God's hand. You know what I mean by the carrot and the stick? Is basically when you think you did good and God didn't notice and people didn't notice, you reward yourself. You go out and get yourself some donuts and feast on it. You're rewarding your flesh because McDonald's knows how to minister to that. They have a whole saying, you deserve a break today. You need to get away. Aw, doesn't that appeal to the lower nature? That's right. Somebody's thinking of me, and I'm going to take care of me. You reward yourself. But the sad part about these people who get into self-sabotage and soulish Christianity, they also have a, a, a way of punishing themselves in a way that's worse than any, any kind of discipline of the Holy Spirit. Discipline of the Holy Spirit only hurts to the point where you change for the better, and you start feeling good, and it produces a freedom a liberty. But when you punish yourself, you're merciless. When you punish yourself, the carrot or the stick, you reward yourself with the carrot or you take the stick and beat yourself. But when you beat yourself, you basically incapacitate your usefulness. And it's ruled by the soul. What we need to do is the loving training of a father to sons. And when you really catch grip that you're a son and a daughter unto God, you don't see the discipline as being beat, and you don't have to reward yourself because he's going to cause you to walk in his ways. And what I learned when I yielded to his will, something that I didn't hear a lot of in the church, I have no way of, of ever experiencing his will other than his pleasure. His will is his pleasure. Jesus said, I delight to do his will. For some reason, religion creeps in there and they say, if you do his will, you're going to be miserable. You're going to have to give up something you wanted to do and suffer. When for me, the only suffering is denying the flesh. Except the grain of wheat break open and die, the good stuff doesn't ever come out. And that's what God's trying to do with our mind, will, and emotions. It's a shell. And what it needs to do is be broken so the taproot grows down and then it goes out. It's interesting. You have to go down before you go up. You go down to Jesus, and he rises in your life to impact your world. Look at 46.10 sometime and paraphrase it that way, because you can just blast through that scripture. Psalm, Psalm 46, verse 10. It says, you know, be still and know that I am God. I'll be exalted among the nations and the peoples and such and something like that. But if you paraphrase it, you could basically say, let it drop, let go, release so that he can rise up and impact your world. That's just normal Christian living, all right? So we want to get to the place. Uh, so rule number one, uh, I need, could you hand me my Bible, Jennifer? Um, I want, to, I want you to, if you have your Bibles and you're watching, this is a good note to take. Psalm 19. Psalm 19. Because what I see taking place is, is Matter of fact, let's say it out loud, and you might even remember it. And those of you uh, from the school, uh, you really need to understand this. This is pivotal in life change. Your flesh can't fix it. Quit trying to fix the fix in the flesh. Self can't fix it. And Psalm 19 <clears throat> Beginning in verse 12, it says, Who can understand his errors? Some translations say your lapses. <laughs> you know, when you lapse. Right. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret faults. Now, who are they secret from? David. He's asking, Search me, O God, basically. Who can understand what makes me work? is messed up sometimes as I work. I have lapses, and I don't even know where they come from. I'm going along real fine, and then the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, uh, those things I'm doing. But they're hidden unconscious. Keep back your servant from presumptuous sin. If you will deal with those secret sin, expose them, let me bring them to death, I can then avoid presumptuous sin. So the key for even learning to live a Romans 7 life is basically learning to, first of all, self can't fix it. Let's say that out loud. 
Self can't fix it. Okay, now we're going to be what? Dependent on God. That's a good start. The law came in, and by the way, how many have ever failed at anything? Oh, that was a trick question. Of course you have. But usually after you fail, the tendency is not to turn to God, but to turn to a law to fix it. That's the beginning of self-sabotage. A law will come in and say, I'm not going to be like that. I'm not going to do that. I'll never. <laughs> Poor Jennifer. Every time she got one of those, we paid, didn't we, Jennifer? Yeah, That's, she's allowed. I'm allowed to have preferences. You have preferences, don't you? Don't you have likes and dislikes? We struggled for a year looking for a house only because Jennifer says, I will not build. Mm -hmm. I don't want to build, mild thing. So we never looked in the right places. As soon as we got neutral and said, whatever, thy will be done. The power of God came down. She was on the internet. She said, bailiwick. The anointing flooded. The God said, that's where we're going to live. I didn't even see the house. And it worked perfectly because it was three stories and it was able to have a, a walk-in basement because my mom couldn't do stairs. And that was part of the goal was to have my mom and dad living with us and she couldn't do stairs. And in, in the South, it's difficult to find basements. So isn't it interesting? You can try to fix something and you can have your opinions of what you like and what you don't like. Sometimes you need to say, I have an, a right to like and dislike certain things. I have a right to my influence, but they must be subordinate to the will of God. All right? And then you get guidance. Then things start to fall into place. That's when you begin to see, oh, wow, God's moving in my behalf. It's because you cooperated and you quit shooting yourself in the foot with your likes and your dislikes. All right? So God's looking for sons that will yield to God. But Psalm 19, who can understand his errors or his lapses? Cleanse me, and this is the way we need to pray, cleanse me from secret faults, hidden, unconscious, so that I don't create a bigger presumptuous sin down the road. Let them not have dominion over me. In other words, don't let them have rule over me. Then I will be blameless in I shall be innocent of great transgression because if you rule and control and it will lead me to great results and that's what we want in our life. We want great results, not just getting by, not surviving, but great results. All right, that's the introduction. Now, all right, you ready for this? You'll remember this for a long time and if you want details on it, we have, we have a series on self stopping self-sabotage but this is how to release the spirit of god all right there are three fears that relate to your mind your will and your emotions because i don't know what your strong feature is you know what i mean by strong feature right are you headstrong in your ideas and opinions are you a willful mover and shaker and unyielding person or are you an emotional person that just kind of floats along under your feelings and you're lived by your likes and your dislikes all three are bad by the way so don't worry. It's just that you will have a propensity to do one a little bit more than other people. All right? But the good news is God doesn't get out until those three are broken. Are you ready to break them? All right. The first one is I sought the Lord and he heard me and he delivered me from all my fears. The will of God for today is I want to get rid of all fears. Fear is devil kingdom. The kingdom of God is the emotional kingdom. See if I lost you on that. The kingdom of God is an emotional kingdom. Righteousness, peace, and joy. And righteousness under new covenant is love and action. So the kingdom of God is love and action, peace, and joy. Those are all God emotions. God emotions are not carnal emotions. Do you understand that? And the whole mandate of the scriptures to love the Lord your God with all your heart and love one another. So the motivation needs to be God's emotions. God's emotions is the motivation, the proper purpose and motivation of life. It's the attitude, it's the character, and it's the motivation. Now, here's the battle. There's three, three battles. The mind battles with, and maybe this is where you're, you need to mark this down and see where you're at. You might need all three, like many. But nonetheless, there will be one that will be problematic in your personal growth. You will sabotage yourself if you don't get the victory. The fear of the unknown. 
That is a mind stronghold. The fear of the unknown, the mind has a choice between darkness or light. Do you want to open your mind to darkness? Then figure it out yourself. And you will come up with weird conclusions. Allow God to be the light and be the lamp unto your feet, so to speak. Let God reveal his plan and his purpose over your mind. Revelation can flow up. Information, creativity. Actually, the Bible even says, I will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. How many have heard that scripture? That word mind is actually a little bit different than mind. It's creative imagination. I will keep him in perfect peace whose creative imagination is established on me. It's like, God, use, use my mind for revelation, for creativity, for insight. If you're a, if you're a musician or an artist, you want, to, you want to sink into God to let that mind be used for creative. It, I mean, I had a guy once that could do a keyboard many years ago, he could play the keyboard, but he would perspire the whole time he's doing the keyboard because he was so intent on being perfect at it, he could never flow in the spirit, could never relax, actually quenched the spirit trying to be precise. Is it a good thing to pursue excellence? Yes. But when you are in control, there's no room for the Holy Spirit to even use that wonderful musical gift he had. It's time to quit quenching, grieving, and resisting the Holy Spirit. When I was a baby Christian, that's what God said. Treat me as a person, not an it. And when you close your eyes and you feel my presence, if you really love me and you want a relationship with me, don't grieve me, don't quench, and don't resist. Actually, he said to don't vex me. That's when, I really, that's when I'm having a temper tantrum. He said, don't vex me. All right. Temper tantrums have to die. So, the fear of the unknowable is in the mind. How, how would a Christian demonstrate this, a practical example? It would be like, okay, God, I know, I know you want me to go on the mission field, but is it now? Is it today? Is it next week? I got to know. I'm going to do my research and everything. You can get so mentally screwed up over it that you miss the timing anyway, and you can't hear them. Because you're demanding to know in advance in your mind rather than trust God to reveal his mind in his time and his season. So you can see it can be a good thing, but it can still shoot you in the foot. You can, and we want you to eliminate that, that sabotage because instead of getting light from God, you've got the darkness of your reasoning mind trying to, to argue. See, the scripture actually says, that if you would know his will, then you can do his will. You reverse that. You try to do his will before you know his will. And, and you're going to, even with good things, you will constantly be out of step, out of time, and wondering why. why. And then get mad at God because it's not working. Isn't that something, the way we can do that? So... The first one then, are you seeing this? You may have a strong feature, mind, will, or emotion. So pay attention. And, and if you're in one of the house schools, I suggest, in the house churches, I suggest you teach this at one of your meetings because this will save a lot of people unnecessary pain and struggle. Unnecessary. There's pain and struggle in life. Life's not fair. But there's unnecessary pain and struggle. I want to see that eliminated. So, all right, let's go to the will. The fear for the mind is the unknowable. Some people just don't know how to surrender to the unknowable. I even had to die to the fact that, Dennis, there are some things you're not going to know until you're with Jesus. Can you resolve that? And he told me to quit asking why and told me, how do you want me to respond? Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you what, it eliminated a lot of pressure in my life, a lot of, thought, a lot of overthinking, there was too much reasoning. And you know what? In this day and age, there's so many variables. You're never going to have enough information anyway. Get what information you need, but at some point, you're going to have to turn it back over to God and say, what do you say? All right? So if you want to sabotage yourself in the fear of the unknown, it's when you demand to know a 
and you won't do anything until you demand a no, when in reality you should be surrendering to his will. And then you will know. The second fear pertains for willful people, strong-willed people. People who, if I don't do it, it doesn't get done. If that's your strong feature, so to speak, your greatest fear, and it debilitates you regularly, these people get depressed, stay in depression for long periods of time, is control. Uh, fear, of con fear of the uncontrollable. How many have kids that are uncontrollable? All right. You don't have to raise your hand. But <laughs> you people on Ustream, how many of you have kids that are uncontrollable? You can actually work yourself into an early grave with worry, trying to control something you can't control. When we traveled to churches, we saw multitudes, literally hundreds of people set free with one verse of Scripture if they applied that Scripture. I don't mean quote the Scripture. I mean live it. You know what it is? Romans 14.4 in the Living Bible. We would take, we'd take mom or dad that was just struggling with that teenager, and they would, we'd have them say, drop down your spirit. Now, they are God's servants, not yours. Now, you tell a mother that, you better stand back five feet. Because <laughs> she'll tell you, yes, they are mine. I bore them. Oh, the pain that I went through. You have no idea. All right. So you got to be careful. What you're saying is they are God's servants, not yours. God made you a steward, not an owner. You see where the transition in the will needs to take place? Be a good steward. Be a good mother. Be responsible. I'm not saying be irresponsible. I'm saying know your jurisdiction and know your mission. Your mission was to be they are God's servants, not mine. They belong to him, not to me. God is able to tell them whether they're right or wrong, and God is able to make them do as they should. The average mother says, no way. I'll make them do what they should. All right? Obviously, there's responsibility. Fulfill your responsibility as a parent. Don't just abandon. But a person who has a control problem will hear it that I'm saying abandon them. Dismiss them. No, I'm saying you fulfill your responsibility. Your duty is to love. Love releases, though love does not control. I prayed with little girls that said, I, I know my mom says I should come and talk to you because I'm being bad, but I want to do the dishes. I want to do the stuff that she says, but she pushes. You know what they feel in their little spirit? They feel like, I'm being controlled or pushed, and therefore the natural flesh reaction is I'm going to push back. Even if I wanted to do it, I'm not now. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? But that will is going to at some day have to be yielded to the fact and the way God did it. In my, you want life with a capital L? Then if you're a will person, you're going to have to learn it the way I did. And that was at first I used to have difficulty with controlling people. Most of you have difficulty with controlling people, willful people. People that when they're talking to you, you feel like going like this. <laughs> Even if you don't do it, you feel like doing that. They're like, they're dictating your life. They're telling you how to do it and what to do. I used to like it when I was a young pastor, and they would always get revelation of what I should do. That's a sign of a willful person. <laughs> it's your revelation, you do it. And then they didn't like that. I prayed about it, and I think you should go see Sally. Well, you got the revelation on it. You're the body. You're part of the church. Go see Sally. <sighs> then they're upset because I didn't do what they wanted me to do. So the Lord taught it to me when I had a lot of very strong women in my church, and they became, most of them, became quality leaders because I don't believe in making them second-class citizens. There are plenty of ministries that treat them as second-class citizens. And I don't believe that. And matter of fact, we went to some churches where they would let me preach, but not Jennifer. And I said, well, sorry, then I don't need to preach here because we flow as a team. And uh, you get both of us or none of us. <laughs> All right. And, but in that, in that attitude, it's like, you know, they're a real 
entity of importance and significance. And actually, the church would be hurting without their emphasis. And usually, to be real blunt, we did a lot of private ministry with leaders over the years. And some of them that don't, that say their theology is not to have women in the pulpit, they also have a wife problem and a lady problem. On very many cases, not all cases, obviously, you don't make blanket statements. But a lot of times, so I'd say, so tell me, what was it like growing up with your mother? I usually get a, a lot of resource like that. Hmm? Just saying. Do with that one what you want. That's your free part. All right. Because obviously that's not across the board. Now, but if you're a willful person, you actually sacrifice life. If you're a mind person, you sacrifice dark, uh, light for darkness. If you are a will person, the fear of the uncontrollable. Here's the way the Lord healed that with me, and this is a good way. So I had a lot of strong women in my church that were really developing, and God was teaching me that uh, some of them have been struggling just to get acknowledged. That's why you feel the push. Once they're acknowledged, the push went away, and for some, for some. But what he showed me was one time my ladies that I didn't consider weak at all came up to me and said, Pastor, there's this woman. My hair stood up on the back of my neck because I'm thinking, they're no pussycats, and if they're afraid of her, I don't know if I want to meet her, right? And I said, well, I'll talk to her. And they said, oh, you'll talk to her. She's on her way to your office. No appointment. She's just, that's a willful person, right? No appointment, just show up. Because God told them. Okay. God didn't tell them I was busy. No. But she came to the door, and I felt like the Lord just dropped a, a, a word of wisdom in. And he says, and I felt his gentleness and his love. And she was like a bull in a china shop. And I just felt God's gentleness and love. And he says, you tell her you love her, but you're going to love her as I instruct you. So she came to the door. Not a good start. She came to the door. I want to talk to you. That, that's not a good way to start, right? Uh, does that put up a wall when you see somebody do that? I'm going to. And I, and I says, so I went right back. I went, look, I'm going to love you. God's already spoken to me. I'm going to love you, but I'm going to love you as the Holy Spirit leads me, not as you tell me. And I saw that when they went to push in the scripture that God fortified it with was when they went to push Jesus off a cliff, he walked through the crowd. If, you, if your will, and you don't have the fear of being controlled, but if you are under the lordship of Jesus and under his control, nobody can control you. Amen. Well, so then what do you do when they try to control you? You say, no, yes, maybe, later, no, yes. You should be able to do that from the place of peace and not live in the fear of the uncontrollable. So you have to learn how not to control, but you also have to learn how not to be controlled. Jesus is Lord. And when he's Lord, you don't fear being controlled by people. Your yes is yes, your no is no. As a matter of fact, if you start manipulating like they're manipulating you, you enter into evil. Let your yes be yes, your no be no. Anything else is of the devil. Isn't that interesting? And we thought we were pretty clever manipulators. Now we found out that's the work of the devil. All right? So basically, God wants you to overcome the fear of the uncontrollable. So how far are we now? We have the fear of the unknown, a mind problem, the fear of the uncontrollable, a will problem. Now we have the emotions. The emotions fear failing. The fear of failure. Because then we go back to the carrot and the stick. We beat ourselves. We become judge, jury, and executioner. And we're going to be harsher on us than God ever was. We're going to make rules and laws for ourselves that are so religiously confining that we're miserable and we think we deserve it. But you're the only one that thinks that. God's up there going, ay, ay, ay. I want to love him or I want to love her and look at her. She's beating herself. Oh. 
I'm not doing that. They're doing it themselves. They self-sabotage when, whenever self is in control, self-sabotages. So failure, the fear of failure is basically what you're refusing is the abundant life that God has for you. And you're letting your likes and your dislikes stand in the way. In other words, how you feel about something. So the real key is learning that some things, let's go through the, the three of them a little bit slower. I want to minister to this, but I want to make sure you've got it. And how many are already getting a grip? Mind, will, or emotions, what's standing in the way? Okay, well, then we're getting ready to minister then. But let's renew the, the mind, okay? The overcoming the fear of the unknowable, the mind, all right? God knows me. Search me, O God, and know my heart, all right? That you want God to search you. Quit searching yourself. No navel staring. You will not accomplish anything. You come up with dumb conclusions. Comparing yourself among yourself, it's unwise, right? Only one I want their evaluation is God searching my heart. Some things I will never know. Okay, you mind people? Can you handle that? There's something. You got to quit getting fr frustrated with, but God's not telling. I don't, uh, I got to know, I got to know. And they're all frustrated. I'm going, that's not, that's not God right off the bat. His, he's never too early and he's never too late. That's you doing that timing thing. So I yield and say, there's some things I'll never know. But some things I have been given to seek out. And how does the scripture say? We've received the spirit, the spirit who's from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. So there's things that God's going to reveal. And he also wants us to search him. If you, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. So he's looking, what he's trying to cultivate into you, he's not hiding from you. He's hiding to see if you will pursue him to find out without getting frustrated. If you get frustrated, you just went back to the flesh. But are you passionately want his will, or do you want what you want when you want it? That's the flesh. So, I love this one. It says, God is light, and in him there's no darkness at all. That's what you need for your mind. Because once darkness creeps in, that's when all the little roaches and all the little critters get into your mind. They love darkness. And so as long as God's not shining his light, you come up with all kinds of crazy thoughts, right? So, but God's word is a lamp unto my feet. The eye is the lamp of the body. When that eye is single on him, your whole body's full of light. God's revelation enlightens the eyes, Psalm 19.8. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. They're supernatural headlights. We have to teach this in all of our modules. Supernatural headlights in the dark region of the non-conscious. Search me, O God, for anxious thoughts and hurtful ways. The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. Some translations say the flashlight of the Lord. The spirit of man is the flashlight of the Lord, searching all the innermost parts of the belly. Let God search and you quit searching. <coughs> if you let him search, he will shine his light on what needs to have light shined on. Even when I sit in darkness of sin or ignorance, God will be a light to me. That light will always be available. It's just a question if I will pursue him in that time. God is the father of lights. We're supposed to be what? Children of lights. That's going to be for the mind people. All right? You mind people? Mind this. All right? You need light. You don't need information. You need light. Okay. Now let's cover those will people. Any willful people in here? Most of them watching by Ustream? <laughs> How many? 650 students in the online school. You need to take this and practice this. We don't have this on the school curriculum. This is good homework. Laws and control, the reason there are laws is for protection. The law is good if it's used lawfully, correct? 
We know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, that is, for the purpose for which it was designed, to protect people, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for a lawless person, an insubordinate. Mm -hmm. I love this because let's, let's look at where law can be love, but you don't want to live in the law. You want to live by grace. There is, at the lowest common denominator, legal love. That's when you won't respond to grace, you won't repent, you won't receive forgiveness, so you go to jail to protect you from other people. That's actually love. That's loving society. That's loving others to keep them from harming somebody. That's legal love. It's, not, it's, a, it's unfortunate that people won't respond to the grace of God, so guess what? There, there is a consequence. Nobody wants to live there, seeing how far you can do legally and illegally. But we live in a time where it's, it's basically redemptive love. That none of us are perfect, but God has made a plan and a provision for us to lovingly receive the gift of his forgiveness and repentance and allow change to take place. Then there's paradise love. That's in heaven. None of us are there yet. Okay, but we're in the redemptive love, and that's the message. As a matter of fact, I go so far as to say the gospel message that of love as the primary commandment, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and one another. I believe that for the body, the love message is a forgiveness message. That's where the rubber meets the road. Because we're not talking about loving those that love you. We're talking about loving the unlovable. And you do that when you forgive a perpetrator, you're actually fulfilling the law. For forgiving a perpetrator sets you free from being controlled by the perpetrator. It does not mean you've reconciled. It does not mean you have to reconcile. People should do a study on the difference between reconciliation and forgiveness because they get very confused and they do crazy stuff. All right? I may have to forgive the person that that uh, broke into our house and stole stuff, hypothetically. But I'll tell you what, I'm not going to invite them to watch my house while I'm out of town. <laughs> right? That's, that's reconciliation. No, no. They, that has to be earned over a period of time. All right? So the will people, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus makes you free from the law of sin and death. To be free... This is will people now. To be free from a lower law, you have to submit to a higher law. So if you're a willful person, you're used to being in control, you're the captain of your ship, and it's real hard for you to release control, and you want to control everybody else's life, the only way to get set free from that is you're actually operating in a fear of control. You're afraid that if you don't do it, it don't, won't get done, is to relinquish it to a higher rule. When you come under the lordship of Jesus, that's a higher rule and nobody can control you and you don't have to fear anybody's control. I like personal freedom, so that really appeals to me. If I let Jesus rule me, nobody can control me. Nobody can make me do anything. But I've also, as I have personal freedom, I'm also willing to love and release personal freedom and not demand or have expectations to control other people. Love releases. Love is a jubilee. And many times we think love is controlling. Look at that father and the prodigal. Don't tell me he didn't love the prodigal. He sat patiently on that porch. But control would have chased the prodigal and made them. That doesn't work, does it? Now you have children, you ever make them do something? They may be sitting down, but they're going, I'm sitting down, but I'm standing up on the inside. You didn't, you didn't really accomplish anything. It's their will, and they have to relinquish it. 
But the fear of the uncontrollable can be broken once they see the, the, the sweetness of life that comes out of yielding and surrendering to the Lordship of Jesus. In this day and age, Full Stature Ministries, this is our cause, this is our purpose for the next generation. And that is, the, days are, the day is gone when you can just say, Jesus is saved, I'm a Christian. You're going to have to move into Lordship. He wants the rule of God, not just that you're saved. Because you can be saved living a confined, restricted life to where Jesus really doesn't have much say. You live by your mind, your ideas, your likes and your dislikes, and you choose. And you're the commander of your ship with your will. You make the choices. That's got to change. That's a problem. Basically, when you say, I must do, you're basically saying, I'm making an idol out of my own self. Self-idolatry. I must do it. If you say, I must know, you're basically allowing lies to rule the thought life. Lies are a stronghold because it's not true. You don't have to know. You just argue that you have to know. You're exalting self. The emotions, I must not feel. That's fear and emotions. I must not fear. Well, that's a good statement. But if you're living in fear, it's kind of like the person that goes... They think if they confess it enough, it'll go away. <laughs> Perfect love can't stop here. Perfect love can't stop here. Perfect love can't stop here. You still, you're fortifying that fear. The fear's got to go. You can't just say the right answer. You've got to live the answer. You can't just say Christianity. You've got to live Christianity. When you live it and say it, you're actually doing something. But when you're just saying it, hoping it's going to change... And the source isn't changed. Emo cognition, emo volition. The emotions control the thinking. The emotions control the choices. And this is the seat of the emotions. This is the door of the heart. And this is your spirit. If you don't win the victory here, you're not going to win the victory here. Remember Rodney Howard Brown did that on Sid Ross' program. I just loved it. He was instructing the way we were instructing. He says, with his accent that I can't do his accent. It was a cool accent. But Rodney would say, this is the head. This is the gut. Big difference, huh? I'm going, yeah, there's a big difference. Big dis distance from here to here. You can do it here. You can do it from the heart. You can do it from the head. But unless you forgive from the heart. You know how many people forgive from the head all the time and go, it's not working. It's not working. It keeps coming back. Because they're not making a distinctive difference. And my favorite expression was Paul Keith Davis. We were doing a seminar and we had all these people doing gut stuff. We had Bob Jones was there calling it the fruit of the looms. <laughs> we, had, we had everybody talking about brain gut, all right? And, and then uh, Paul Keith Davis made a good one, he says. And this explains how sanctification works. He says, this is the historical record. This is the heavenly record. The historical record says, boy, I blew it big time. I sinned in 1932, and it was bad. But when I talk about it, I'm clean in here. The heavenly record says it's been washed away in my spirit, but it's not been erased from my mind. I used to get tired of hearing people say, just forgive and forget. God's not an amnesiac. When God forgets, he's saying, I'm no longer holding. I've washed it out and cleansed it. But it's written right in the Bible. Abraham staggered not at the promises. Do we know a different history about Abraham? Did he stagger a few times? But he's clean in here so you can say, Abraham staggered not at the promises of God. He was washed clean. David was a man after all my own heart who will do all my will. Oh, really? I think he murdered. I think he committed. That's the historical record. The historical record is there for our instruction and reproof and correction so that you don't do it again once you're clean in here and it's erased in here. Can you see the difference of how significant that would be if you start learning to live from the heart instead of the head? I mean, basic Christianity 101. I just loved it when they intended to throw Jesus off that cliff and he walked through the crowd. 
It's not my time. I'm so surrendered to my Father by the power of the Spirit that if you attempt to push me off the cliff and I've got to go to the cross, yeah, there's nobody going to push me off the cliff. But I don't have to fight. I don't have to run away and hide. I can walk right through. It's a beautiful picture of the way we're supposed to live under the Lordship of Jesus. All right? Now, the last one, the emotion. For you emotional people, interestingly enough, when you're a young kid, my dad can do anything. Then you get a little older, and you start thinking, I think I'm smarter than he is. <laughs> He's old-fashioned, or, you know, whatever. And when I grew up in Chicago, the whole idea was the quicker you didn't need mom and dad, the more mature you were. Right? The quicker you grew up. And we grew up too fast. But we saw stuff at age nine that nobody should see at any age and in the inner city type stuff. But when God got a hold of my life, he says, you know the way you thought your entire teenage years? Mm -hmm. It's the opposite in the kingdom. You mature to the degree you become dependent upon Father. You learned your whole life, the more independent you got, the more mature you were. Now, there's a healthy independence, but maturity prepares you to become interdependent and part of society and relationships of all kinds of people and learning how to navigate as a king, as a son, and as a daughter unto God, regardless of the kinds of people you're navigating through. So I saw that what God was basically saying is that just like Jesus said, what, how old was Jesus when he died? 30s? Mm -hmm. And what did he say? Abba, Father. I go to my Abba and your Abba. That's Daddy. Now in the South they say that at any age, but in the North you don't say that after you're six or seven years old. You don't call him Daddy. You call him Father, Dad, Pop, whatever. Daddy? That's kind of like we're little kids, except I noticed there's cowboys, and I'm not going to argue no cowboy from Oklahoma or Texas that calls his father daddy. I'm going to say, it's okay with me. Jesus called his father daddy. But isn't that something? Abba, father. I'm going to my Abba, my father, your father. I'm ascending. He, was, he had that kind of intimate relationship where he was dependent on the will of the Father regardless of his chronological age. He was not looking for independence or I can do this myself. I don't need anybody. So Jesus modeled the principle of dependence for us. I am in the Father, the Father in me, the words that I speak to you. I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me. He's the one that does the works. I want to be a little love slave of the Lord Jesus, the Apostle Paul. For this reason, God called me to be apostle, separated unto God, so that he might reveal his son through me. All right. The ability to act and the power to accomplish, that's basically possible. Sons yielding to daddy. I was bought with the price. I'm not my own. I'm God's servant, not mine. This is when God made a transition for me in the area of the emotions. He took that Romans 14, 4 in the Living Bible where he said, they're God's servants, not mine. They belong to him, not to me. God had me take that scripture and personalize it and say, I'm God's servant, not mine. I belong to him and not to me. And God's able to tell me if I'm right or wrong. God is able to make me do as I should. And that's solved the likes and dislikes. It's not about my likes or my dislikes. But what I found that surprised me was when I abandoned my will and my likes and my dislikes to be neutral to God, I found his pleasure. Whereas religion was teaching me that if I surrendered fully and completely to God, he was going to have me do stuff I didn't want to do. Do you ever hear that in your head? Did you ever get that impression? Then, well, that's the lie from the pit, and the only way to beat it is to say, you know what? If there's such a thing as abundant life, if there's such a thing as this Christian life where I can enter into that pleasure, then I'm gonna, there's only one way to find out. I can't say, show me, show me, show me. You yield, and he will show himself. 
If anyone love me, I will reveal myself. First, love him enough to surrender to him. Enter into a more implicit trust. I love it. I want to close with this one little story Jennifer put in here in my notes. She loves this. About the peregrine monks in Ireland. Missionary journeys. They were so yielded to the Spirit of God. Picture this. This is a little frightening to me, but um, if God told me to do it, I'd probably do it too. But they would get in boats with no oars or rudders, just a sail. And they would trust that God would send winds that would direct them wherever they wanted to go to evangelize. That'd be like us traveling without a GPS, Jennifer. (laughs) That could be frightening. We could end up anywhere. (laughs) Two directionally impaired people. Traveling ministry. I can remember one time Jennifer had a little mini meltdown in the car. Remember? Because we're going... We pull in a gas station, pull out of the gas station, and then we look at each other. Did we come from that way or that way? (laughs) And at that time, I was still new to Jennifer, and she spoke with such prophetic authority. She'd go, that way. Well, anybody talks like that, they got to know what they're talking about. And she'd be wrong wrong 50% of the time. So I'm going, that authority doesn't impress me anymore. That way. She's guessing just like I am. And this is to find churches. This is to find churches before the GPS days. And then one day, the pastor and his wife invited us to dinner at their house. And the kids in the neighborhood took the signs off the poles. And Jennifer's in tears going, she's manifesting, going, I am never going to eat at anybody's house again, ever! Unless they pick us up, I'm not going. We're going door to door knocking. Do you know, do you know so and so? And the people go, nobody knows their neighbors anyway. In Connecticut, right? We finally found the house. And Jeff, I'm never going to eat at anybody's house. I said, well, careful now. We might get in trouble with that. I will never. Oh, yeah. We had a pastor. We were staying at their house. And the where was that? In the Berkshires. Yeah. Great Barrington. We've been, there a lot of times. We've been there lots of times. That was kind of like a central point where we would. And we're driving, and I'm going, Jennifer, all the times we've been here, I cannot find a house. I cannot, or up and down the street. I know I'm on the right street. We're up and down. <laughs> Finally, we see the pastor going like this out in the middle of the street. We pull in. You know what he did? They painted their house a different color. Oh. And it was like, we don't know what to do. Don't change the paint without telling us. We're looking for a green house, and there's no green house. And we've been on this street a dozen times. So they used to make jokes about us being directionally impaired. Uh, she may be watching now, Dr. Laura Chen uh, from up in Massachusetts. Uh, she, she got a kick out of it one time because we are Denny Kramer, uh, Brian Simmons, uh, Mickey Robinson, and I, I can't remember who else was there, but uh, all the big name speakers were there for the conference, and I testified about this little story of how we're directionally impaired, and it was when GPSs first came out. So uh, Dr. Laura felt sorry for us, so she got us our first GPS. But then she felt guilty because can't just give it to Dennis Jennifer, got to give it to all the speakers. <laughs> So all the speakers got a GPS, and I'm thinking, and they were saying how thankful they were that God blessed them with a GPS. I said, we'd be more thankful if I was not dysfunctional. <laughs> you would not have been blessed. You got a GPS due to Jennifer and I's dysfunction. So it's strange how God works, isn't it? So let's pray through these three and then close. I just feel this is important. Are you going to study some of this and look at your own lives and evaluate? Because I'll tell you what, it'll, it, this is a year of Jubilee. I want you set free. And if you've got a mind that's a little too strong or if you've got a will that's a little too strong or you've got emotions that you're still living too much by what you want to do and when you want to do it, your likes and your dislikes, it'll sabotage what God wants. Never be afraid to be neutral before God because If you honestly yield to him, you will find his pleasure. His will is his pleasure. And it's like 
uh, and it becomes more and more effortless. It's not that, don't get into that religious drudgery that if I obey God, he's going to take something that would make me happy away from me so that I can suffer. That is pure spirit of religion. And I want to cut through that right now today. Okay. Father, in the name of Jesus, any religion in us that we're not even aware of, search us, O oh God. But I'm going to yield my mind, will, and emotions so that the release of the Spirit can get through that outer shell. I do not want to hinder it with my ideas and my opinions. I don't want it to hinder revelations, insights, and, and uh, creativity that would flow to my mind. Uh, Father, I want a breakthrough in, in my will. I don't ever want to fear uh, the loss of control, nor do I want to fear people who are controlling. I want my will to be uh, comfortably subordinate in, by your spirit. Oh, see, that feels good to even say that. My mind, will, and emotions are going to be comfortably subordinate to the Holy Spirit in me. I yield them to you. My emotions are not my own. I belong to God, and because I belong, I've got a lot to give. So my likes and my dislikes, I'm always going to have likes and dislikes, but I do not want my likes and dislikes to trump over your choices in my life. So Father, right now, all you mind people, I am surrendering and receiving forgiveness for letting ideas and opinions stand in the way of revelation, creativity. I receive forgiveness and I present my mind to the Lordship of Jesus for revelations, impressions, insights, creativity. My mind belongs to God and the mind of Christ can rise up and influence me to the revelations flow. For the will people, I release forgiveness to anyone that I feel is a controller. Anyone that's a push, has a push to them. Out of my belly, I release loving forgiveness to them because I'm going to enter into the control of God and you can't control. There's a nice release. I release those controlling people. Now, if I'm that controlling person, I'm releasing demands and expectations on people. I'm releasing my demands or expectations. They are God's servant, not mine. They belong to him, not to me. And in that release, I will fulfill responsibility where need be but I'm going to fulfill my responsibility from the place of supernatural peace, the rule of God. Let the peace of God rule. When peace rules, Jesus rules. Emotions. God told me, Dennis, entertain every person you come in contact as, as if they were a, an angel sent from God because divine appointments you don't, are not going to match your likes and dislikes but they are part of the potential fulfillment of your destiny. So, Father, we just thank you for the people you place in our life, the difficult ones, the not-so-difficult ones, and the ones that you love deeply, but all have been placed there for a reason. So we thank you, God. We thank you. And I release my likes and dislikes, though I'll always have them, I don't ever want them to override the will of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm, that feels good. You know what it feels like in here? It feels like Jesus is Lord. That means he got past your mind, will, and emotions. Let the kabod come upon us. Let the weight, the weightiness and the presence of God come upon us right now. Soak in that presence. We've created an atmosphere, an environment that's conducive to his weight and his lordship. Tell me, uh, just slip up your hand. How many can tell there is a presence like a blanket? Because when you're neutral, it's easy then we honor you, God, that I believe he's wrapping himself around us in a, in a greater measure that we may carry that garment, not just in a meeting, in a corporate anointing, 
but in the highways and the byways and into our families, into the workplace, into the school. There's a, there's a level of peace that you're going to carry with you, and it's militant. It's not passive. It'll crush the enemy beneath your feet. You will change the environments. The next people you talk to, don't be surprised if, if you don't create a pleasant atmosphere that they can actually pick up. I want to radiate that. Comfort them with the same comfort where I've been comforted. If you've been comforted in your freedom, you can comfort others. You can't give them something you don't have. But I believe we're going to release the comfort of God this day into the lives of people. Now, I'm feeling mostly the peace and the presence of God. But I want you to know that the next thing should be his pleasure. You believe you're in the will of God, at least walking in as much light as you have? Then in the will of God is his pleasure. This is the way you feel right now, right this minute, is the way you should feel in any circumstance if you're in the will of God. Negative or positive, you should internally feel this way in the midst of negative circumstances. You can perceive negative circumstances, but you don't have to own it. You should be evangelizing the atmosphere. Greater is he that's in you than than maybe angry or upset people evangelizing you. So, Father, we release that anointing, a river of his pleasure, and we bless people. If there's any people that are, that are frustrated, lonely, hurting, that we're going to be that warm blanket of his presence, that even without a word, there's going to be an anointing that's going to comfort the afflicted. Because after all, he afflicted us, our comfort this morning, didn't he, with this message? He afflicted our comfort, so now we have an obligation to comfort the afflicted. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com.